Sarmatian uh, dress. How was it possible to draw on the aesthetics of French absolutism in a country declaring itself republican? Similar observations can be made in virtually um, all forms uh, of art, architecture, and crafts. An answer based on the story of national or Sarmatian culture um, and magnates falling for Western fashions, as well as the Polish cultural dichotomy in the 17th and 18th centuries, and those are works from the recent monograph that devoted to uh, portraiture in old Poland, were not satisfying to me. Uh, such narratives collapse under juxtapositions like this one, a portrait usually described uh, in historiography as Sarmatian or Old Polish, here by the way by a uh, Dutch painter, with strikingly similar Venetian portraits. Uh, moreover, the Sarmatian costume also grew on openly absolutist Ottoman aesthetics. Mm, those simple comparisons uh, points to the challenges posed by the central peripheral perspective of art history in an important manifestation of which, in my opinion, was acceptance of Sarmatism as a historical phenomenon rather than a modern scientific construct based on Polish socio-political thought of the 18th century. Um, in search of an answer and a framework that would allow to go beyond the limiting categories in the study of art patronage, I came to reflect uh, on the essential um, for whole Central Europe, uh, dichotomous juxtaposition of aristocrat and magnate, which is rooted in the central peripheral perspective of art history. <coughs> Early attempts uh, to, distinguish it, uh, to distinguishing artistic phenomena in Central Europe relied on German language research, uh, primarily the Vienna School, usually focused on the idea of the former Holy Roman Empire, sometimes extending to the area of Habsburg rule. And still, the criterion of Central Europe as the geographic location had not been precisely defined. Therefore, let me give the floor to the sources. Uh, on the slide, you can see the marked eastern borders of Europe taken from several early modern atlases. Uh, and drawing an average from there, um, one can more or less precisely indicate the central area of Europe as it was seen uh, at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th centuries. Uh, and the diameter of this circle is around uh, 1500 kilometers. Uh, the boundaries of Central Europe um, deduced from the source largely correspond to those first proposed by Eberhard Hempel in 1965 and much the third year later concept by Thomas da Costa Kappen. However, the space so defined in the context of um, considering artistic patronage differs in its approach to the important disposers of art, the highest social strata. From a legal point of view, uh, the representatives of the nobility in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth were people. However, there is no doubt that um, division in uh, this class played an important role in the social uh, realities of the state. Um, in order to distinguish the allied, uh, primarily uh, economic, because money should be considered uh, as a factor followed by other factors of power, such as uh, political significance uh, or clientelism, the term magnate was introduced. In a sense, this concept was opposed to uh, aristocracy, asso associated explicitly with the post-feudal system and aristocratic titles that did not exist in, in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. My considerations obviously should not lead into the denial of factual historical uh, phenomena, namely social and political uh, situation related to the previous existence of feudalism in certain parts of Europe and the legal state uh, situation of the nobility. The etymology of the word magnat justifies its use to some extent. Like a magnatus, 
great, mighty, indicates a significance based on um, extra legal and vague premises. Um, however, the question is whether the epistemological distinction does not affect the, let's say, ontological uh, layer of the problem. Because the distinction between aristocracy and uh, magnateria can be obfuscatory because it can be used to describe the, the highest social strata in early modern times. Um, uh, sorry, uh, as a term describing the um, highest social strata in early modern times functions only in. Re oh, sorry, uh, sorry. <laughs> Distinction between the aristocracy and uh, magnateria can be obfuscatory because it can be used to describe social. Uh, historical uh, but not artistic conditions. It is worth noting that um, the magnate, as a term describing the highest social strata in the modern times, functions only in relation to uh, Poland, Lithuania, and Hungary. Uh, although I feel that uh, Hungarian researchers use the term aristocrat more freely, uh, and that is uh, a historical construct. Um, the East-West divide, realized in the concept of aristocrat or member of Hoch, Adel, and Magnate, obscures the complexity of art patronage in Europe because it possesses a simple and unbridgeable dichotomy of West practices and their Eastern imitation in the mainstream art history, but sometimes also in local studies, show us peripheral offshoot of Western art, a provincial manifestation of European heritage. Uh, the multi-level hierarchy of aristocratic titles and dependencies in the empire and Habsburg monarchy, uh, especially after 1648, from a legal point of view, has nothing to do with the republican uh, character of the political and social system in the Commonwealth. It should be noted uh, however, that some phenomena, such as clientelism or the king's prerogative to determine, determining uh, the right to exploit royal assets, resulted in similar actions in the Poland, Lithuania, uh, and the Holy Roman Empire, despite the different legal structure. The right to control a given territory and the practice of strengthening their position with it, uh, within did not differ much in both political entities. Uh, here I have used as illustrations uh, the, the manifestations of, uh, of controlling and marking um, the space of aristocracy. And in the picture on your right, uh, you can see decoration um, based on the coat of arm, uh, especially um, emblem from the coat of arm of and Krasinski family, which is Raven, uh, which is repeated throughout Jan Bonaventura Krasinski's private uh, town. However, I reject the idea that a given notion of an aristocrat or magnate is clearly an indication of the practice of artistic life. Um, I prefer to try to look for certain patterns within broader perspectives. Uh, however, it seems to me that from the perspective of art history, the notion of the magnate is insignificant uh, or maybe more precisely without meaning in the light of pan-European aristocratic practices of ostentation of social position. Um, I see the concept of aristocracy as a research tool, tool in a similar way to how uh, Michael Baxendal saw the art market as a space for diverse artistic options that um, do not determine the, a priori uh, the shape of artistic practices. The discourse on early modern art is marked by several problems, the manifestations of which can be identified quite well in the reflection of the artistic patronage of the highest social strata. And uh, these are in particular. First, the center-periphery uh, perspective, whether consciously or not, it is constantly uh, recurring in art historical research. In the context of the Vienna School expressed bluntly by Georg Dechiel in the 1920s, 
in his concept of Germany as an active mediator, transferring Western patterns to the East, which nationalist um, central peripheral structure culminated in the works of uh, Wilhelm Pinder in the 1930s. Secondly, uh, the question of nationalism and uh, politics, particularly evident after the Second World War, when pointing to trans-regional relations between Germany and Central Europe, uh, Central European countries might have seemed to confirm the uh, nationalist arguments of German scholars. On the other hand, the understandable distancing from Germany resulted in the rise of nationalist theories in the then Eastern Bloc countries. As a result, um, scholars have searched for phenomena, especially uh, differences that could explain the peripheral nature of art in Central Europe. It was also linked uh, to the typical belief in art as an expression of national character. The notion of the magnate has become such an attempt at, at uh, a historical constant for national or, or region. Uh, this is travesty of Hans Sedlmayer's words from the 1931. And lastly, uh, the attachment to the, of art history to history as kind of superior, uh, superior science whose findings determine the history of art. In other words, the history of art as uh, perceived as uh, part of the history of, uh, of the state. Uh, if the historically proven existence of feudal structures in a given territory was framed by the later aristocrat magnet dichotomy, it was necessary for scholars to follow such, uh, such a path. Mm. These factors led in the second half of the 17th, 20th century, sorry, uh, mainly from the 1960s onwards, um, to the creation of the perspective that Jan Bakos described as patriotic nation state centered art history. Um, the newly noticed centers uh, of art, such as royal and aristocratic courts, uh, and here I know the overlap of the perspective with the development of the reflection on artistic patronage, in example, uh, the works of Francis Haskell, were still seen as expressions of a particular, um, particular state or state-related policy. I believe that this perspective has, no long, uh, has to a large extent survived, at least in Polish art history, until today, and has not been overcome by the process of noticing large artistic regions such as Central Europe. It did not overcome uh, this because the concept of Eastern Europe, proposed for example by uh, Jan Białostocki, affected by uh, Karaman Thought, implied the existence of multinational organism with a common history, uh, common artistic traditions, similar natural conditions, and similar socio-political realities. Jaustowski included in the area of um, what he said is Eastern Europe, today's Poland, Czech, uh, Slovakia, and Hungary, state organisms uh, whose historical, political, social, and natural experiences in the 17th century do not meet the requirements for a single artistic region especially in the socio-political differences that runs along the border of uh, Habsburg rule. And Białostocki was uh, talking about 16th century realities, uh, which were much more similar. I believe that the transnational, cross-border, and to some extent supra-political perspective I have adapted in the treatment of artistic art patronage can lead to the recognition of patterns of artistic practice among the highest social strata. Uh, the notion of Central Europe would then serve as a kind of common historical experience in the most general sense, similarly as presented by Thomas da costa uh, And a clear uh, narrowing of the subject. Thank you very much.
very much. And uh, excuse me for my um, uh, in the introduction. I'm, I actually uh, thought it was going to be uh, spoken from the, on the later period. Uh, so, but it was on the Polish Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth. Thank you. Uh, later on, we will continue with discussion. And now, I, um, our second speaker uh, in this uh, row is uh, Antonia Mikotia from um, Southern University, uh, who is going to uh, um, show us a bit more uh, the, uh, the, the architecture, heritage, and monuments protection under the fascist government in Zada during the uh, actually from the 1920s until the 1940s. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. I will talk about periphery and center. In this case, uh, I will explain why Zada was the periphery of Kingdom of Italy, former Kingdom. Uh, so, well, uh, uh, in this map, at this map, you can see the former territory in red line. Uh, because between two world wars, Zadar became part of Italy after treating Rapallo. Uh, two years before, in 1980, uh, after World War I, uh, actually it was occupied by an Italian uh, army and they came in Zadar. After two years, it was officially uh, confirmed that uh, Zadar and some islands became uh, part of Italy. It was Italian territory on the other side of the Adriatic Sea and it was some kind of periphery for them, but very, very important periphery. Here you can see one of the first actions done by the Italians. It was burning down the monuments. Monument uh, built on our Nova Riva, new waterfront. waterfront. Uh, it was uh, erected uh, not so uh, far from that year. And uh, it was burned down because it was Austria, an Austrian uh, monument built in Zadar, commemorate also soldiers who served in the Austrian army. But uh, a few years later, as you will see, they also planned to build another monument. Um, the second, uh, what was very important to Italians, uh, was to uh, build something considered uh, as a proof of Italian Italian, consideration of Italian influence on the other side of the sea, on Dalmatia, but especially in Zadar. In this case, Italian Post decided to send some gifts in Zadar. It was uh, archaeological material. They decided to, some parts, uh, to send some parts of coal and capital to build uh, this monument uh, for him. And uh, it should be erected uh, near post in Zadar, in historical center. Uh, this is some of the solutions that they gave from the artists, different artists, how that should look. And this is uh, the final result. They used those gifts, archaeological fragments sent from Rome, uh, as one uh, more proof that this was Italian territory historically. And uh, they, uh, they erected this uh, uh, in front of the post in Zadar. Uh, I didn't locate it all the parts, some of them are in the center uh, even today. I don't know what happened during the war with the past, but it's not there uh, anymore. Uh, on the left you can see uh, the postcard with this important monument, and on the, on the other, other photos is actual monument uh, in some documentation that I found. Uh, after war, the monument was destroyed after World War II, and today, in front of our archaeological museum in Zadar, we have this red column. It was uh, for many years unexplained what is doing there because on the Roman Forum, a Roman preserved in Zadar, they didn't use this kind of uh, stone. But uh, during our research, we have found the source of this uh, gift sent from Italy. Since they burned uh, down the Austrian monument, they decided to build a new one. First idea was uh, to build a Dante monument, and they went, they sent some uh, people from Zadar to Duce to discuss this big uh, Dante monument, but they eventually decided not to build that, to build uh, some 
army monument dedicated to the fallen of a nation who fought uh, in the Italian army. And this is a solution that one. Uh, it was made by Antonio Bassi, Italian uh, sculptor, who was uh, also involved in several uh, monuments. Uh, of, they, they look similar almost, uh, in some aspects uh, to this one. Um, and it was erected in 1928. It was very important to the community in Zadar because after Zadar became part of Italy, I think around 9,000 9, Croatians moved out of the, uh, Zadar and in Zadar uh, uh, came 8,000 people from Italy. Zadar became Porto Franco and it was very important to build business there because it's, it, was not, it, it was much easier to earn money. And they wish to decorate this monument. They decided they will ask Italy to send them uh, in Zadar four Roman sculptures that were eventually, before that, uh, actually um, uh, excavated in one small town called Nim near Zadar. And it, it should be decoration for this new monument. But uh, uh, the director of the museum and other. Uh, experts said, uh, no, it's, it's too, too close to the sea, we can't put them there, and they said uh, they will be in museum. Museum was also a very important place uh, for fascist party and politicians uh, to demonstrate this Italianità uh, spirit in Zadar. I will talk about it later, but uh, uh, sculptures were saved, let's, let's say, and uh, they were in museum. This is the monument, it was destroyed, of course, uh, during moving, but what was the main? It was um, uh, destroyed uh, uh, after World War II as a sign of the Italian uh, government, as they burned down, out, uh, burned down the Austrian, uh, Austrian monument, a uh, similar thing happened with this one. It is also erased from collective memory, and only just old, old people call this place in all city monumental, but we didn't know which monumental was there. So you can see uh, it was dedicated to the uh, naval uh, ships and uh, fights that they had on the sea. I, in the back you can see the verses from uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio. It was very much loved and adored in Zadar, especially by young people. And, uh, uh, the surrounding of the monuments uh, was um, arranged as a park. Uh, park is still there, but uh, other parts of this uh, architectural and monumental old uh, part of other elements were removed. Uh, they even in, in, in one moment, I didn't. Uh, uh, it was not clear in which year they put this uh, inscription in front of the. Uh, monument as all the Roman uh, arm and coats, let's say, to prove that Italian Italian once more. Uh, it was very popular popular place to go there to take a picture. So I had, I had found some pictures of people who used to live in Zadar uh, making photographs, family photos uh, here. And uh, this is very, very nice photo uh, during the war. Many uh, celebrations and uh, army parades end up here. So it was a very important place of, to, to show on this periphery how important it is to uh, government in Rome. Uh, this is something that is very uh, new uh, discovery. Uh, this is the municipality building on the main square in Zadar. It was built uh, in the end of the 30s and it's still the municipality building. Uh, only on this uh, postcard it was uh, shown that there are some words on, on, on this building, but we didn't know uh, what they mean or what is written, but eventually with the help uh, from a friend from Italy who is, uh, his family used to live in Zadar, but they moved to Italy for and he uh, helped me to read it, translate it, and uh, to determine who was the author of those uh, of this of this poem. Uh, let me show you. It's here. Uh, so uh, it, it, it is a small piece of lost history of Zadar that we were able to 
to excavate again. It's not archaeological excavation, but it's, it was big, really important to see what was written there. So uh, we, we uh, uh, find on the internet that the author was Arturo Covati, very, uh, for, he was a very famous journalist, but, but also a person involved in culture and theater and other aspects of cultural life, but also it was very important uh, to the idea of uh, commitment that Dalmatia uh, it's actually should be, and it is, part of Italy. Um, after the war, the building survived bombing in World War II because that was pretty much destroyed and uh, continued to serve as a municipality building. But uh, those works, uh, plans, this plan was erased uh, from the building, but some parts stayed, you will see later. Uh, this idea uh, was also connected with uh, 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 something that uh, Duce liked a lot, to build a new aesthetic, new cities. So they gave a lot of effort and money to build new buildings, but also to make uh, uh, new streets, new uh, gates uh, in city, historical city walls. And they planned to put tram trans transportation in Zadar. That's why they decided to build a bridge between uh, old city, historical city, and other side, on the other, and connect the other side on, on, on the other side of the mainland. So today we are also using those uh, aspects of this urbanization, but the, of course uh, bridge didn't, didn't survive the bombing, and we built uh, several uh, different bridges. A uh, few days ago we celebrated 60 years of this, this post-war bridge, but after World War in 1949, uh, they built uh, some 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 uh, temporary solution. This this bridge that was built uh, very very interest, interesting construction, but it lasts almost 13 years. Uh, today, as you can see, um, most of the reliefs on the buildings are removed after World War. Uh, still, there are some reliefs connected with. Uh, uh, what uh, Italy in this time believed that should be Italian territory, and they uh, inscribed cities, coastal cities, from Copart to Dubrovnik uh, on the city walls, on the city on the walls of the city uh, building. But uh, then they are still there. People they usually don't know the history of the building, and they don't know that those reliefs with creation. Uh, cities are built during this fascist uh, government and uh, with, to support the idea of pretension to the other side of the sea. Uh, and he here you can see you can see something what what uh, was fascist time, but uh, some parts parts are missing, but it's still there. After World War uh, Two, it was very interesting to see. Uh, that there was liberated in the uh, uh, end of October 1944, and the politicians came uh, very soon to give some speeches from the balcony of the municipality building. But they were surrounded by, by many fascist signs. Uh, they were not aware of it. As you can see, you can see allies and the flags and the pictures of the presidents. And they gave speeches uh, from that balcony, but surrounded with those insignia. Uh, eventually, uh, everyone was, every, each of them, were removed. Uh, the last was uh, this lion head, but uh, it, it's not still there. It was also removed in the 50s. Even Tito, when he came in Zadar, uh, gave speech with some of the insignia, but uh, most of it was clear by then. Uh, this is elementary school, and this is something that is, it was also not known. Uh, the school's, school was also inscribed with uh, fascist signs. Uh, on the corner of, of the main entrance was written the name of the school. It was called uh, Antonio Cipico, a famous Italian poet. But on the, above the three doors, on the central doors were uh, three fascias. 
On the other two was wolf as a symbol of Rome and the lion as a symbol of Italian uh, and the Venetian uh, uh, influence of this uh, city. Uh, near the school was built this uh, building. It was a military building. And on the corner of the building, building you can see a really, very <laughs> large uh, fascia. Those elements were removed and uh, erased from the collective memory, but it was able to rebuild uh, the history of those buildings uh, in, with help of documents, of course, but also uh, with photographs and uh, postcards that are a uh, very important archival source for us today. Uh, they also built something that was from the young people uh, to educate them in fascist uh, um, way also to, it was given like in Hitler state, a lot of effort in sport and uh, different kind of manifestation. Um, it, it was not preserved in all uh, his uh, uh, poem, let's say, but a far part of it still existed today, but I think it will be destroyed in a uh, few next few years. And also, uh, besides architecture, urbanistical idea, uh, they uh, had a lot of um, uh, connection, politicians, especially fascist party and other with uh, art. They decide to give some objects from Zadar to Italy but also to politicians, and they uh, received some uh, items to the, for archaeological museum is other from Angola. This is lion, a uh, sculpture of the lion uh, that was in archaeological museum is other, but it was uh, from Shibanik city walls. It's a city near, near uh, Zadar. At one time, uh, one of the politicians decided that this would be a great gift to the Nuncio because he loved everything connected with victory. And they removed this from the museum and sent it to Italy. Uh, you can see here uh, the entrance to the museum located in San Donatus Church without uh, lions. Lion uh, was um, sent to Italy and we believe that is, uh, that is here. This is Vittoriale. Vittoriale, the, the very important place for the Nuncio. Uh, besides this lion, many arm and cords from the Adriatic from the Adriatic Sea was sent uh, there as a gift. One of the important uh, gifts to be given to the Danuncio was this ancient glass inscribed with "Take with Victory," and uh, uh, people from the museum were not happy to give it as a gift to some politicians, but young people were very in, in love, let's say, with uh, the Nuncio, and they steal it three times. And uh, eventually they sent it to Ancona Museum to be more safer than in Zadar, to prevent this uh, force uh, giving gift uh, to the Nuncio. Uh, another project that was very important was uh, San Donatus Church. Uh, it was uh, surrounded by the buildings and they decided to make a demolition and arrange this building on uh, remains of Forum Romano in Zadar to show another connection with Italian architecture. Uh, the, the construction is very interesting for us who are involved in history of buildings and uh, urbanization of Zadar, but eventually they uh, finished the work and you will see how that uh, looks back then and how how building looks uh, today. Here you can see uh, one of the archaeologists and uh, people from surrounding villages uh, as a working force. This was the, the, the beginning of the excavation of Forum Romano in Zadar. And uh, you can see that they uh, were sure here that uh, this is uh, the Forum Romano, so they decide to um, presented here and put those four sculptures. As you can see, two are here, one is on the other side and one was inside the museum. And they decorated the whole building um, in a way that looks more uh, in, in, in way of Italian, Italian spirit. 
but uh, they decide to eliminate, eliminate some aspects and elements of his uh, architecture. And after war, uh, the building is alive. The bombing, which was a miracle because in most of the buildings around it were destroyed. And uh, in this building was a museum, archaeological museum in Zadar. In April of 1944, most of the movable collection of um, Zadar's museum first was sent to Italy. And it's in Italy still today. Because uh, in 1962, they decided to sign a contract. And uh, they said that we can keep those four imperial sculptures that were sent to Zadar to be decoration for that first monument that I show you, and the remaining of the collection stayed in Italy, including that glass. What was staying, what stayed in Zadar? Uh, it, it, it is this very important uh, art uh, collection of uh, silver and gold that is uh, today located in St. Mary Church in Zadar. Uh, this uh, stayed in Zadar because they were not able to dig it out from um, uh, ruins after bombing in Zadar. Uh, in 1939, they, they decided to, that this, the cities should be redesigned in more a way like uh, Dulce, for example, designed for me. In, uh, with big streets, new architecture, new Roman Italian style, as they like to refer to it. Uh, this is the main uh, square, let's say, uh, uh, in very, it's very close to the, um, to the Saint Donatus Church. Uh, but this was not able to be finished because, our, because of the war. Uh, this is some examples how that I could look if this revelation was, uh, if, they, if they had time and money to, to build this. And this is a uh, war time in 1942. We, uh, they celebrate an action of the nation given to Italy by uh, Andy Pavlic, the president of the independent state of Croatia. And it, it was very uh, important uh, anniversary for the whole city. All the villages uh, should, uh, all people from the villages and island were uh, obligated to come to Zadar. Uh, to raise the right hand to to uh, uh, go on the new the new river uh, in, to to um, uh, be uh, able to govern Bastiani give it give the fascist uh, salute. Uh, those pictures are saved in Instituto Luce. Instituto Luce had a lot of uh, films and uh, pictures and uh, uh, photos that help us uh, a lot to rediscover the history of the Zadar between two wars, because most of the archives uh, that are connected, for example, to heritage, are uh, destroyed during bombing, and uh, it was some kind of subject that was not uh, popular, let's say, uh, to research uh, after World War II, uh, so it was very uh, see this uh, because very, uh, the pictures are uh, very, very uh, dark. Uh, this shows the Atro Verdi, former uh, big theater in Zadar. Uh, since uh, new uh, people who moved in the city after World War, because the, most of the Italians uh, uh, went to Italy during the war because they were scared of what's been happening with them after World War II. Uh, they uh, look at this theater, uh, even though it was built uh, by Austrian government as Italian. So uh, on those pictures, uh, you, you will be able to see that it's too dark. People are tearing uh, boots from the walls and uh, putting them down into the theater. So the destiny of many architectural uh, elements uh, was influenced by the politics. After World War II, Zadar was also by President Tito, uh, considered as an Italian city, and that cost the city and many monuments, especially uh, uh, palaces and houses, uh, cost them to be blown, blown out uh, or destroyed by bombs after World War. 
and it took a lot of time to take out the stigma as Zadar, from Zadar, as an Italian city. Uh, it took uh, a lot of time. But today we are trying to rediscover, to tell the story about what happened uh, during those uh, uh, Italian years in Zadar history. Thank you. And uh, now, uh, now we are going to hear uh, another speaker, uh, which is going to be Mariana Pinto Santos uh, from, from the uh, Lisbon Institute um, of the Art History, uh, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences in Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, there is also going to be uh, more information about uh, specific. Um, on the team, on the dance, interactive sites, and then on the specific uh, Portuguese situation within the South and region. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Franco, and thank you for having me here. Um, I am going to talk about um, arguably the, the most important Portuguese art historian um, and his, uh, about his relation with the concept of periphery. And then I'm going to briefly um, make a comparison with Yuvo Karaman's uh, approach to periphery in the end, with some problems. <laughs> um, so, the art historian, critic, editor, and curator, José Augusto França, you can see him. This is a 2016 picture in uh, a Lisbon Garden, and you would always read the French newspaper, Le Monde. Um, the art historian, critic, editor, and curator, José Auguste França, he died last year, uh, actually a few months ago, uh, almost 100 years old, um, was the author of an enormous bibliography on Portuguese art history, culture, and architecture that spans almost 60 decades. He was responsible for establishing the historiographic canon for the Portuguese 19th and 20th century art, writing both under the dictatorship and after the Carnation Revolution. I don't know how uh, many of you are familiar with the Portuguese political history, but uh, in Portugal there was a dictatorship from 1926 until uh, the, car the so-called Carnation Revolution of 1974, which, is, which was an, an extraordinary revolution because it was specific. There were no, they managed to not have violence in overthrowing the, the, the dictatorship. Um, so we wrote both under the dictatorship and after the Carnation Revolution. This was the revolution which ended the dictatorship and that also put an end to an ongoing war for the liberation of the Portuguese, then Portuguese African colonies, paving the way for decolonization. José Augusto França began by writing novels, but he soon became an art and cinema critic as well as a gallerist, and he also tried painting. His first novel takes place in Angola, where he lived after his father died from 1941 to 1945, during the Second World War, and tried to take care of the family business related to the coffee trade. He came back because, as he said 60 years later, he could not adapt to seeing the misery caused by vile colonialism. Until the early 60s, he was, 1960s of course, um, he was mainly an art critic and curator. It was in 1962, when he was 40 years old, that he presented his thesis in history at the Sorbonne in Paris, where he began studying in 1959. And this thesis was about the reconstruction of Lisbon following the 1755 earthquake. And that study later led to the classification of the urban design of Baixa Pombolina, downtown in Lisbon, as world heritage. As an art critic and curator, he promoted the first surrealist exhibitions in Lisbon, firstly also participating as an artist, and afterwards no longer as an artist, but exclusively as curator. In, 19, uh, six, in 1952, he opened his own gallery, Galeria de Marso, 
And although it would only be active for two years, more than 30 exhibitions were organized showing modernist artists, surrealism, and shortly after, abstract art. This is in a context where there are no galleries, no art market, and the state is controlling uh, most of the art production. Briefly. <laughs> um, briefly put. Franza, uh, George Franza presented his specialization thesis on the sociology, uh, sociology of art, written under the supervision of Pierre Van Castel in 1963 at the Ecole des Études in Paris. And it was titled Portuguese Art and Society in the 20th Century. In his thesis, he identified two high points in 20th century Portuguese art. The avant-garde in futurism uh, from 1915 to 1917. This corresponds also with the first magazine promoted by the poet Fernando Pessoa, probably heard about him, um, followed by an accentuated depression that lasted until a new high moment with surrealism and abstractionism, abstractionism in 1945, 47, and after. The depression corresponded to belatedness, which Franza explained as being the consequence of the lack of transmission of knowledge between different generations of artists. This diagnostic diagnosis made by Franza as an art historian confirmed his own choices as an art critic and curator in previous years tracing an evolution from surrealism to abstractionism, which corresponded to the French art history narrative. However, in Portugal, the first abstractionist paintings were made before the first surrealist experiments. Nevertheless, Franza only included them in the narrative after they were exhibited in his own gallery in 1953, therefore maintaining the linear progressive story of Portuguese art in parallel with the French narrative and emulating a local master narrative from the modernist master narrative on abstractionism, on abstractionism that dominated the international art scene. His work on Romanticism in Portugal, a thorough investigation with no parallel uh, since then in Portuguese art historiography, was presented as a doctoral thesis to the Sorbonne also in 1969, so he was almost 50 years old. In it, he would again conclude that although some positive points emerged, the general balance was very negative for 19th century Portuguese art. Belatedness is therefore a recurrent diagnosis both for 19th century and 20th century in art in Portugal. His key concept which is at the basis of his methodology, is mentioned in almost all of his introductions to his books. He refers to his art is doing work as studies on social cultural facts or facts of civilization. This concept is indebted to Pierre Francastel's project of a sociologie des objets de civilisation, which is at the basis of the French author's well-known book, Art and Technology in the 19th and 20th century, in which he stated that art is as much an object of civilization as technology, and that both are interrelated. Still following from Castel, France uh, writes that a cultural fact reflects social values and at the same time proposes values to society. In later texts, he allows a further designation artistic fact, always referring to its double function, reflect, reflecting and proposing. For Franza, the proper and fu function is what makes art a civilizing factor. <coughs> Although Franza's approach was inscribed in the field of the sociology of art, he maintained that the artistic fact is a totality with full autonomy. It is the role of the expert, the art historian and critic, to bring that artistic fact intact in its unity and to identify how it functions and how it acts in society. An object of civilization lives its conjunctures. The sociology of objects of civilization reveals them, you can see in the slide. This means that this history of art that presents itself as sociological understands this sociology to be the ascertainment of the impact that art has on society 
more than the consideration of the political, economic, and social context in the production and reception of works of art. France's art historical stance may be traced back to that of the estrangeirados, which I can translate by foreigners, a, a term coined to refer to the Portuguese men, and they were always men, um, who since the 18th century had had a foreign education or an interest in what was foreign. Estrangeiro in Portuguese means foreign. Uh, José Augusto França inscribes himself as an heir of a previous generation of estrangeirados from the 19th century when he writes in his work about Romanticism in Portugal that the estrangeirados from the Enlightenment were the only Portuguese that could guarantee the viability of the social cultural structures of the Portuguese Romanticism with their dynamic nationalism and open mindedness. For França, there were, they were the exception, as he himself was an exception, the ones who defended the French Revolution idea of civilization while a generalized mediocrity triumphed. France's education with Franck Castel confirmed and fueled the narrative of belatedness based on the contrast between civilization, identified with European centers, and primitive or underdeveloped, identified with the periphery which was well established in the Portuguese intellectual tradition. The intellectuals worried about the inability to be civilized while denouncing and opposing the authoritarian regimes, whether it was the Inquisition in the 17th century, absolutism in the 19th century, or fascism in the 20th century. Uh, these regimes that had contributed to the decadence and progressive loss of civilizing European, so they said, qualities. In other words, theirs was a progressive stance. Um, adopting this stance meant that France was opposing to the Portuguese fascist regime he was witnessing in his own time. There is a dual analysis to extrapolate from this. On the one hand, he maintained the order of discourse that assumed a privileged historical position for, for Europe, seen as a synonymous of civilization. On the other hand, we must also notice that the standard for progress and civilization, which he saw in Paris, was also the standard for democracy and freedom. What did it mean to be civilized? It meant being European. It meant not to be left on the periphery. The conception of art as a civilizing factor and as an autonomous totality allows him to blame art for not civilizing, that is, art was responsible for its own belatedness and for the society's belatedness. It had an inherited, inherited uh, incapacity uh, to affirm itself within European parameters. It is in this context that we can understand France's defense of abstraction joining his voice to the mainstream narrative as so many other artists and art historians. In France, after World War II, as well as in the, uh, the United States of America, it was abstract art that was elevated to the position of absolute modern art. A three-volume publication in 1973 claimed French ownership in, in France, in, this publication was in France, of course, claimed French ownership of abstract art, arguing that the weight of the French capital in Western art gave it special status and affirming that abstraction dominated in Paris, in Paris since 1945. It is this French narrative that France emulates, promoting Portuguese artists, practitioners of abstraction lyrique, one of the French abstract movements, especially Elena Vieira da Silva, who was, in fact, well established within the abstract scene in Paris. She lived in Paris. By promoting abstractionism in Portugal, France aligned Portugal with the European civilization. This means that the regular diagnosis of belatedness regarding a peripheral European country is aligned with the master narrative that hierarchizes. Uh, continents and countries in power relations, which are both the producers and the products of the master narrative. This segmented idea prevailed after the Carnation Revolution of 1974. 
In fact, José Augusto França writes an immense amount of work after the revolution, and in the meantime, he became the director of the most important art magazine published by the Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisbon, uh, a magazine called Loki Watch, uh, which uh, was um, published for over 30 years. It was also after the revolution that his art history became institutionalized with the creation of the art history department at my university in 1974. We find, unsurprisingly, Pierre Francastel writing in his Sociologie des objets de civilisation with, a, with an Eurocentric view, arguing that Europe is the home of outstanding technical and artistic capacities that made the continent more adaptable, therefore associating those capacities with the ability to construct a superior civilization. Of course, he's meaning Central Europe. Not. As Samir Amin wrote, Eurocentrism is based on prejudice and on the idea of Europe as a superior universal model, believed to be imposed by the force of circumstances and natural evolution. This has been the common ground for the modern construction of European identity, special after the Enlightenment, and for constructing identities inside Europe, electing models which other countries can get close to or fail to emulate, being less European than the others, even if inside Europe. This construction is ideological and has sustained <coughs> economic and political power in which art and culture have played their part. Art history has contributed to this Eurocentric ideology. As is well known, it was born as a scientific discipline from an Eurocentric position that mythified antiquity, Greece, as the birth of culture. Later, Jakob Burkhardt's The Civilization of Renaissance in Italy, with his thorough examination of every aspect of culture, embedding, embedding art in its cultural, political, economy, economic, and religious uh, uh, contexts, helped to establish the equivalence between art and civilization, considering them mutually interdependent. The ultimate example of civilization, and therefore of art, was Renaissance Italy. For Frank Castell and his student José Auguste França, it would be modern France, or more actually, accurately, Paris. In short, the historiography of art takes European superior, superiority for granted from the Renaissance on. France's art history adopted a subaltern so position which when exceeded, could be celebrated, for it meant that mar marginal work was catching up with the center, with civilized work. However, the subaltern position he assumes for Portuguese art, and many others after him until today, uh, and the desire to overcome it reinforces Eurocentrism without dislocating art historical narrative from the point of view of the winners. The late art historian Fortuny Lajo, has, uh, she was Greek but radicated in Portugal, has referred to this subaltern position, uh, which at the same time desires to get to the status of modernity, um, as a provincial cosmopolitanism, that is, and I quote, we are valorizing the art of the center over that of the periphery, especially if the latter happens to be one's country of origin, is mistaken is mistaken for a sign of open-mindedness and progress. In José Auguste França, periphery is made analogous to a delay to belatedness, thus dislocating the dichotomy center-periphery from, sp sp from a spatial frame to a time frame, in which the center has the referential time and the periphery is inescapably late. The periphery as a temporal cat category in which ideology is translated as topography has been extensively analyzed by my colleague Fotini Blachu. In contrast, we can see that the three concepts of Yugo Karaman introduced to re rethink regional art production are against the grain, the temporalization of space that the European uneven distribution of power stands to perform. Borderline, provincial, and peripheral are taking as positive stances, even though Kahneman establishes a hierarchy of freedom between them. He considered the category of peripheral art the one with potentially more emancipatory possibilities 
because of its connection with regional traditions as well as its openness to multiple centers without conceding them authority, rather reinventing and reconfiguring the information or the vocabulary or imagery they could provide. Kahneman's proposal, in spite of strong differences, is part of the rethinking and reevaluation re of the periphery, which some authors later underwent, like the already discussed Carlo Ginsburg and Enrico Castelnuovo's 1979 essay, Centre Periferia, in which they consider the periphery as non passive and as resistant to the center. Or later still, Piotr Petrovsky's Horizontal Art History, which establishes a non hierarchical analysis, analysis of art historical subjects and the idea of active reception of the periphery. And also Nestor Cantlini's Multi Temporalities or Beatrice Joyos Brunel's Transnet, Transnational Art History. One of the main differences I should argue between Karaman and these latest uh, uh, authors would be the strong interdisciplinarity that these later authors have used to rethink the periphery. Um, Kahneman's categories also messes with ideas of orig originality and it allows hybridity, eclecticism, heterogeneity. Nevertheless, as Fotini Blacko alerted in, 19, in 2016, it can still be seen as operating within the same conceptual frame which hierarchizes center and periphery in the first place. As she wrote, although Kahneman's arguments might be seen as supporting the concepts of eclecticism or active reception, the idea of artistic freedom as such is a tricky one. Much like originality, it is a canonical value, and, it, as, and as such, its definition derives from the center. We are thus in danger for valorizing the periphery merely for not being the center and doing it with its own conceptual arsenal. To conclude, we can contrast these two art historians from the European East and West peripheries and their opposing views on the status of the periphery. However, we must contextualize their art historical writing in their political national contexts. First, França is writing mainly about contemporary art, of which she was an actor as critic and curator, and in the first days as, also as an artist. So he wants to interna in, internationalize this art, this contemporary art of, of which he is also a part. Second, if for Karman it was important to identify a national Croatian art, however hybrid and eclectic, França wanted to break with art historical writing identified with the search for national identity. The national lack of belated or belatedness was associated with the long lack of democracy and with the nationalist dict dictatorship. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, in order to uh, keep the schedule, we will now have a, a 10 minutes break and then another session and then leave the discussion afterwards after the second session. Is it all right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay.